Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll just stay out of that. My name is Steve Dvorak. I'm um, a company called DVO. We're out of Chilton, Wisconsin, which is south of Green Bay, north of Milwaukee. Um, we've been doing anaerobic digesters since 2001, and I'd like to tell you what we're doing on the uh, nutrient recovery, which is related to the back end of the digesters in our case. Okay, we apply it to um, all types of organic waste. Doesn't have to be just animal manures. We do a lot of food waste and so forth. We actually work uh, indirectly, or in some cases directly, with a lot of the, the sponsors in this room. Uh, so we do that. Um, I put in a uh, Packerland digester in 1985, which is now owned by JBS, so it's competitors, obviously, in some ways, to the people in this room. We're taking, now currently taking paunch manure from them, uh, from American Foods Group, we're taking daft sludge. Uh, we're doing a lot of things uh, from those plants. We're taking in um, waste in some of our digesters from Ben and Jerry's in Vermont. We're taking in some Tyson sludge. We're taking in some uh, Smithfield uh, daft stuff. Uh, so we're doing a lot of that. Uh, we put our first digester in 2001 and we're over 90 sites right now uh, that we have operating digesters at. So we have probably over 250,000 cows going through our digesters, uh, just to give you a sizing. And we're also uh, rapidly expanding overseas. We're finishing up uh, digesters in South Korea now, which is almost entirely on food waste. Um, some interesting challenges. Every place you go, you find a different challenge. South Koreans have a tremendous amount of salt in their diet. So any of you that know what salt does in the digestion, it gets to be a little challenge, but we're, we actually have gotten past that. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about Storms Farms today from, uh, they're here in North Carolina. They're a contract grower for Murphy Brown Smithfield, raise hogs for them, they ship their hogs to them and they take the Smithfield daft sludge back and put it in the digestion as well as their hog waste uh, right out of the barns and they also raise some poultry so we're getting uh, poultry waste and uh, dead animals and so forth to put in the digester. This is a picture of that. Um, our digesters are a little bit different than everybody else. Most people have upright tanks and we have uh, in-ground flat covered concrete digesters. So if you kind of see that design, it's generally pretty much our digester. Um, they take like I said, a lot of different ways. This is some daft sludge coming in, and it will go into the, the digester. We have a about a 22-day hydraulic retention time at this digester. Um, we vary that depending a little bit on what it is. We do generally a little less on hogs. That's our standard design for, for dairy and bovine. And poultry, we actually go a little bit higher. So because this is a blender, we kind of kept it about 22 days. But uh, poultry, the feathers and so forth, we like to have just a little longer retention time here, a little harder to biodegrade. Um, they're producing power. They're running it in a um, uh, Martin Machinery Gloss Core Reciprocating Engine. And uh, this is a 600 kWh engine, 24 hours a day. And we're in the process now of adding a second engine to that because getting enough biogas that we can produce more. One of the problems, let's talk about our problems a little bit. One of the problems we're having in the digester industry is that we can make biogas and it's getting harder and harder to sell it. No question about that. Midwest, I'm from Wisconsin. Midwest is not very good. Uh, I've got 26 digesters in Wisconsin. We used to get eight to nine cents and now we're getting three and a half. Uh, so if that's a complaint, so be it. But it also is affecting our industry. Where I see the industry going is less and less of this machine and more and more of the CNG. I really think that's what's going to happen. And especially on your larger facilities, uh, Mark Stormland was introduced before. Uh, from Fair Oaks, we, we have uh, our digester there is going to a CNG st uh, station that Mark was very instrumental in putting in and we're pretty excited about that. We're doing some larger projects in the West that will be CNG going to California. California is, of course, the golden state now because it won't be more for renewable energy. 
But we're, we have this, and we probably have about 150 engines running on biogas right now. Um, what do we get out of digesters? We get plant-ready fertilizers. Digesters, as most of you know, go through the process of mineralization inside the digester. It takes three to four years to accomplish with soil bacteria. We're able to do in that 22-day retention time. So we're doing a very good job of mineralization. We're getting more plant accessible material. Uh, Dr. Ricardo is shaking his head yes, but that is true, and it makes it a lot easier for people who want to develop fertilizers. Okay. Um, so we have that. We're getting storage reductions, especially on the solids. We'll do on bovine, we'll do 45, 50% solids reduction in the digester. We've got to make that gas out of something. But when we put fats in and we put food waste in, we might get 60, 70, 80% solids reduction. Odor control, we do a very good job at odor control because we're doing a very good job with bottle fatty acid removal. And uh, so we have a lot of data, we'll do 97, 98% bottle fatty acid destruction. The EPA and some of our studies we don't then, they basically credit us that with a 97, 98% odor reduction. Greenhouse gases, of course we, we get credit for that because we're destroying methane. BOD, COD, we'll show some slides here. We do a nice job of reducing that. And why is that important? If you have spills or so forth, which even in the state of Wisconsin, we still have spills all the time on our, our farms. It does not have to be CAFOs. It's always remarkable to me that CAFOs get all the blame. I grew up on a farm looking for to do cow, which is a long way from CAFO. But in the state of Wisconsin, the majority of spills are non CAFOs. And of course, we produce renewable power, whether it's electricity or CNG. I, I, uh, Carl talked on this a little bit. We do have a phosphorus recovery system. Uh, it's basically a DAF system. The DAFs have been around for a long time. Uh, my previous life, I worked for a uh, meat plant in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We started putting these in in uh, the mid 70s. Now I dated myself a little bit. Um, but they've been around for a long time. They've obviously improved, but the principle is still basically the same in some way. The solid separation and so forth makes it, makes it work, as I Carl said. But this is um, a very nice, simple, in my opinion, elegant system. I have one, as an engineer, I have basically one overriding design criteria. I have to be able to put this in on a farm that's going to be run by people who don't speak English and probably have a turnover every six months. That's a design criteria. So I don't have 10 computers, I don't have all that because I don't know who's going to run them and Steve the Bork's not going to go and change it and teach them every six months how to run this. So you have to make it pretty simple and these are pretty simple machines that are able to do that. Same with the digesters and so forth. Hopefully the people in our room that have them will tell you that. We were able to get over 90% of the phosphorus, no issue. On uh, bovine, we're actually able to do a little better than that because we do a two-step two -step separation process. Uh, so we're able to do that. It doesn't go away. We're not destroying it. it. doesn't go up in the air like ammonia goes up in the air. But we're able to put it in a solid form, much easier to handle, much easier to control. You can put it in a bag. Uh, but that's really what you're trying to do is give a liquid that's much easier for the farmer to handle because that's typically where the farmer or the waste producer gets in trouble is on the liquid side. So we're able to do that. Uh, Billy Storms, uh, the owner of the farm, very nice gentleman. I'm going to guess his age is about 75 and he's running this so it is possible to do that. And um, he's, um, like I said, he's actually putting another one. This is the separated solids from that. This will be, right here, this is probably about 78% moisture, 22% solids, stackable, does not leach out. Certainly is dryable after this fact. Uh, if you're putting in a reciprocating engine, you've got actually more BTUs that, from that biogas going in the form of waste heat than what you do going in the form of electricity conversion. So we have plenty of waste heat available. 
We have uh, some of these out where we're using waste heat off the engine and we're able to dry this product, especially the poultry product. We're able to dry this up to the 95% level and we've got a very dry product <coughs> if we do that. Uh, so that is certainly possible. Okay, so some figures. The digester influent, and this is hog waste, which is our lowest. Bovine waste is generally about 8.5 to 9% total solids. Poultry waste is all over the place. It can be anywhere from 25% as it comes out of the chicken, up to 75% when it finally makes the trip at the end of those long belts and they're drying it. So it does vary, but in this case at Billy Storms, we have digester influent total solids 3.5. And we have total suspended solids 2.6, follow solids <coughs> 2.1, and that's our beginning phosphorus. Okay, actually pretty high level at a very very liquid state here. The liquids coming off the phosphorus recovery system, you can see what we're doing here. Okay, and these are the numbers we're getting here. And these are the solids that come with off the other end of the uh, DAF unit. And you can see, of course, where everything is going. And I think that's very similar to what Terry and the cars were. So that's what you can do. Uh, we have a little, we don't use a um, coagulant. We're just using a flocculant polymer. Um, but, so we're actually able to get it done for that. You can get in your car and drive to Billy Storms and see this today. So that's what we're able to do. Okay. And it's a simple system as you guys know too. We also do ammonia recovery. We're not doing it at Billy Storm because he doesn't have that much ammonia at 3%. But we do this pretty much at all the poultry facilities. Poultry of course has got higher protein levels, dry crops, so we get a lot more ammonia. And we're doing this more and more at the dairy facilities, because even at 8.5%, we're finding that it's economically feasible to do that. What does this do? I think I read yesterday or the day before that we now are going to, on CAFOs, have mandated ammonia or emissions requirements to, to test for. What we do is, in the digester, we're going to do what the soil does, as I mentioned before, the mineralization. We're going to break down those proteins, amino acids, the ammonia, ammonium. And when we land spread that, just like it always does, we're going to get a high percentage of that that goes up in the air. No question about it. Whether it comes out of the lagoon or land spreading, it's going to happen. Before our digester liquid sees the light of air, if you will, we strip the ammonium, convert it to ammonia by pH adjustment. We're just using aeration to do that. We actually have a patent from Washington State University. I think we have somebody in here from Washington State University. Um, but we have a joint patent from Washington State University. We strip the ammonia. We hit it with sulfuric acid. We make ammonium sulfate. Uh, we have a site in in Ohio, that's making two and a half tons of 40% ammonium sulfate a day. And I would tell you, in my opinion, that that ammonia is the stuff that would naturally go up in the air because it's the easy to strip stuff, which would be the same stuff that would go up in the air if you put it on the land or in the lagoon. So we're saving the equivalent of two and a half tons at 40% a day. Uh, we have numerous ones on. Um, Dairy cattle, we have one in Wisconsin that we use for our research and we're doing about a half a ton a day right now. We've been doing that for three to four years. Uh, the one in Ohio we've been doing for six years. So this is not, this we can do. I mean, this is not pie in the sky, it's, it's something that we do. Um, and we, we're very proud to be doing this. We're selling this to local co-ops. They're using it for ammonium sulfate. Um, an interesting thing, I consider myself a farm boy but as we clean up all of those coal-fired plants, we're buying more sulfur. Everybody know that? That's a fact. I, mean, I, I still run the home farm. I buy ammonium sulfate for my wheat and my alfalfa that I never had to buy before. Because I'm now I'm sulfur deficient. 
doesn't come down naturally for free anymore. Not saying that's bad, but there's more and more of a market for ammonium sulfate. So in some ways, we created a market for something by cleaning up the coal pile. And you're going, to, you're finding more and more co-ops on <coughs> sulfate all the time because of that. Or else there's some gypsum or some other thing like that, but that's what's happening in the market. Okay. So we are able to do that, and we're doing that very successfully. Um, this is our stripping tower. Uh, we use a two-stage stripping tower. This shows you what we're making on a liquid form. Uh, it's again at 44, basically 44 percent. So ammonium sulfate is roughly at 210024. We're making 40 percent of that, and we have a two-stage stripping tower. We're very proud of that. We get air emissions coming off this tested all the time by the local governments. And we're getting zero discharge coming out of the discharge, so we're happy about that too. And I'm going to put my case out there that I think by doing this, our emissions off of these farms are less than anybody else's. We also obviously have done some field trials. We've done stuff like this, or we've done it on large acreage of wheat and so forth, and you can definitely tell the difference. And this tells you a little bit about what we really do when we put it all together. So if we have influent, VOD, start off with that, CODs, fecal cow forms, pretty good number. I've seen them over a billion. Okay. We have a problem in Wisconsin. The EPA people in this room made me know that. We have a problem in Wisconsin. One of our counties got a lot of karst features. We have some problems with 36 contaminated wells. We have BOD in those wells. They're brown. They've got other things we don't want to talk about, bovine rhino virus and so forth. But really the thing that gets most people upset is this right here. And this comes out of the digester at this. Comes out of our phosphorus recovery at this. Ammonia recovery comes out of that. This is the phosphorus reduction, nitrogen reduction, ammonia, and you can of course read all that. And we can achieve a class A liquid for land spray. So the other issue we're having is a lot of communities are regulating the irrigation of manures. And in Wisconsin, where we have rolling ground, we have a lot of extreme beds and so forth, well, you can't irrigate within 300 feet of that. It's almost impossible to do. You I mean, can't make a sense of pivot without having that happen almost in Wisconsin. But if we get to a Class A liquid, there's a, we're actually getting some variances on that. So this is turning out to be a pretty nice thing for us, for our customers, because we're able to do that. Okay, makes sense? Yeah. I don't know, I'm just okay. to So that's, there are some definite advantages for us to be able to do that for our customers. 